God wants to empower us so that he can use us in the gifts of the spirit so that those gifts can be ministered to the church. God wants to empower us so that our prayer lives will be uh, powered and amped up so that we can receive all that God has for us. God wants to empower us so that when we say that this is the way it is in Christ, that's the way it is in Christ. God wants to empower us to always keep the devil under our feet and, and always have authority over whatever he may do or try to do in our lives, in our families, in our community, and in the world. And so now with that being said, uh, uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 would be my first uh, verse that we'll go through here today. Uh, it's one that uh, is a part of our um, foundational verses for the study of maximizing kingdom authority. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, but you shall receive power, that's you, you shall receive power, uh, dunamis power and ability when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me, my witnesses, says the Lord, to tell the people about me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now I read it in the Amplified Version. Then another verse in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, this is where Jesus told his disciples, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing, nothing shall by any means hurt you. You need to underline that because I really believe some of us have gotten a little fearful about the COVID-19 thing. The Bible says you're empowered and nothing will by any means hurt you or your family. And I claim that in Jesus' name. Then David said it so eloquently in 2 Samuel, was, was quoted as saying in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 33, he said, David said, and son, the scripture basically said, David said, or son, uh, God is my strength and power. He makes my way perfect. So it takes the power of God to help me perfect my life to help me to grow and mature in the things of God. Acts chapter 4, verse 33 says this, And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. So now, grace is God's unmerited favor. Then God couples his grace working in your life, his favor working with your life, and marinates it with his power. We have the ability to overcome anything the enemy may throw against us. Then last but not least, it's basically a personal testimony on my part about how God has empowered me to be a servant or his servant. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, and this should be part of the uh, 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 scriptural entourage of any pastor or minister of the gospel. It says in my speech, and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Hallelujah. So my confidence, my faith is not in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Hallelujah. Now remember, what we really need is a revelation of our kingdom authority that God has given us, given us this authority, but we need a revelation of that authority operating in our life. Now remember, a revelation is the highest form of knowledge. It is an understanding of God's word at the level of your comprehension in which you are accountable for. A revelation of God's word changes your character and removes doubt from your life. And so now with that being said, we understand how important a revelation is, but we got to get an understanding and importance of how important revelation is when it, in terms of our kingdom authority. Now, revelation, excuse me, uh, we want to maximize or increase the power of God working in and through us. That's our mission. We want to maximize or increase the power of God working in and through our lives. Now, then God gives me the permission and the authority 
<laughs> to empower me. God, excuse me, I said that wrong. God has given us the authority that empowers us and gives us permission to govern, rule over, and manage our affairs according to his word having first place in our lives. So that tells me that God has given me the authority to rule over the circumstances that may arise in my life. But it will never happen if I'm not established in his word and I understand the importance of maximizing not only my relationship and fellowship with God, but my relationship and fellowship with the Holy Spirit must, must be a must in my life. And with that being said, I told you uh, last Sunday and last Wednesday there were several things that I needed to do if I'm going to be all empowered to do what God called me to do. And these things I need to grow and develop by. Number one, I need to pray and get, and get results. I need to know I can pray and get results. Hallelujah. Number two, and I'm going through these somewhat quickly. Number two, I need to learn how to tap into the grace God has given me, which is his unmerited favor, whereby I gain the righteousness or right standing with God without uh, counting on my own worth or value. And it is nothing I can do to earn that grace. He gives it to me freely. Number three, I have to be confident of the fact that God loves me. Be confident of the fact that God loves you. Now let's go back over those first three. I'm a little slower today than I was Sunday. I want you to get this. It's, this is a foundational lesson for you maximizing your spiritual authority or kingdom authority. Number one, pray and get results. Number two, walk by faith. Number three, learn to tap into the grace God has given you. Number four, uh, be confident of the fact that God loves you. Hallelujah. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Number five, train yourself to hear the voice of God. Number uh, seven, know who you are and what you possess in Christ. It's important that you know who you are and what you possess in Christ because then it builds a confidence in you. Hallelujah. That, that, that surpasses any doubt or fear. But I need that revelation. I need to know again uh, who I am and what I possess in Christ. Then I need to know the difference between victory and tolerance. Because if I don't know the difference between victory and tolerance, I'll put up with things that really I have been given authority over. And that's, that's something. I, I, you know, I've, I've, I've done some things... Uh, uh, I bought glasses, and I, this is just recently, and I never checked to see if, checked to see if I had uh, vision insurance or my vision was covered. I, and I got these about a year ago. I, when I paid for them. I found out a couple of days ago I didn't have to pay for them, okay? And so, <laughs> and so anything, anything that I choose or do not know can be used against me, and it becomes a norm. Because if I did not get the knowledge, it would have been normal for me to continually pay the price for those glasses. And I would have been tolerating, it, tolerating an issue in my life where I had the victory over. And so that's what I mean. Know the difference between victory and tolerance. Amen. The things I choose to tolerate in life speaks volumes about who I am and what I allow to permeate in my life and give me guidance in my life. And so now, uh, uh, go to 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Because in order to operate in this kingdom authority that I got, I got to know that there's more than one world that exists. Okay? Because once I, can, I learn that there's more, world, more than one world exists and understand how they operate, I can maneuver myself into position where God can give me the most out of both realms. Amen. So I understand that what I can't see doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I just can't see it. And it changes my attitude in prayer. Got it? We walk by faith, not by sight. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18 says, while we look not at the things which are seen, which means that the things are 
that which are seen must be seen or he would not be telling you not to look at them. Got it? And so now it says, but at the things which are not seen. So I'm supposed to readjust my vision and not look at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. Why? Because the, for the things which are seen are temporary. They are subject to change, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Then Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which is a powerful, powerful verse. It says, now faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for. Things hoped for that I have not been manifested yet. Things hoped for. In other words, then, then if I got my fillers out and I have a goal and I've attached my faith to that goal and I believe I receive until it actually manifests itself, then my word or the word of God becomes my evidence until it actually manifests itself in my life. That's why the word of God says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, this is just a quick course in faith. So then, faith and the word of God are synonymous terms, okay? You can't have faith without the word of God, and you can't have the word of God without faith. Faith in the word of God is like the wet with the water. When you go to a restaurant and you order water, the weight, uh, excuse me, the wet comes with the water because the wet is a property of the water. Faith is the property of the word of God. Got it? So whenever the word of God is taught, faith is always present. And so now, it's important that you remember that. Now, Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 is another verse, and we're going to get into this lesson a little bit deeper. I don't have a whole lot of time. It says, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth, visible and invisible. Whoa. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Verse 18 says, and he is before all things, and in him all things exist. The Amplified puts it this way. He is also the head, the life source, and leader of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he will occupy the first place, he will stand supreme, and be preeminent in all, in everything. So, this, these scriptures together helps me to understand that the spirit world is more real because it existed first. Now, uh, Zachariah Jensen invented the microscope around 1590. And until then, the smallest thing that a human eye could see could be no wider than a person's hair. Wow. And when the microscope was invented around 15, in, in the 1590s, suddenly they saw a new world of living things in, our, in the water, in the food, below their nose. It opened up a whole new world of cell biology, microbiology, histology, a whole new world. And so now, that's, that's, now listen to me very carefully. Those things existed even though with the natural eye they could not see them. But when Jensen invented the microscope, they looked into a world that had already been there, always been there. Now, for the first time in the history of mankind, they see something they could never see before. Well, I'm here to tell you now, God has placed a microscope in your spirit, whereby you can discern spiritual things and observe natural things. That there is a way he's given us where we can tap into the spiritual world and pull from the spiritual world things that we can't see, pull from the spiritual word, world the things necessary for us to live a victorious life in Christ because we uh, gained knowledge of and got a manifestation of the promises that he's given us in his word. Now, and so now, uh, I want to start now by giving you a snapshot in biblical history 
of one of the most powerful uh, men that God used. That man was called Abram or Abraham. Now, Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. The first three words in that verse, I want you to underline after these things. Because there are two things that happen in Abraham's life or Abram's life up to that point. Number one, uh, God had told him, I'm going to give you the land in Genesis chapter 12. But then after the covenant was forged in Genesis chapter 15, he told, God told him, I have given you the land and you already, and, and you, are, and we are, and I've already done it. Basically, that's what he's saying. So let's go back and recap a little bit about Abram's life because before he promised him the land, then he gave him the land, and in between that, a whole lot of things happened. Amen. So now, this teaching is designed to empower you to trust God in the most trying of times, to teach you how to apply the principles of God's word so that you can have the victory God intended you to have in this time. So now, after these things sets the tone for what was going on in Abram's life. After these things. After these things. I'm going to pound that in you for the next 10 minutes. After these things. Amen. So now, let's go back a little bit. Let's review what happened up to this point. Now, Abram, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, it reads, After these things, the word of God came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Now, Abraham has just pulled together one of the most impressive military victories of his day. King Chedorlaomer was conquering every territory and all peoples in his sight, and he had, he had overrun then what was called Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, Abraham's nephew, and his family and all his possessions were in Sodom and Gomorrah when Chedorlaomer had taken it. A messenger comes to Abraham and says, look, your nephew has been taken away by this conquering people, Chedorlaomer and his army. So then, when Abraham hears the, the news, he puts together 318 of his trained servants, and Abraham divides them into two forces, and he ambushes the forces of Chedorlaomer and defeats them. He surprised them. He rescues Lot and takes the spoils of war and then on his way home he gives a tenth of the tithe of everything that was taken to uh, Melchizedek. Now then Melchizedek turns around and he blesses him. I mean it sounds like everything's going cool. It's smooth. Then the Bible tells us that Abraham was troubled. He, was, he had really be, become troubled. Now remember, this was an ambush and Chedorlaomer had friends. Got it? And the remnant of his army was still alive and they went out to recruit other soldiers. Other, in other words, they were going to come to Abram, they wanted some payback for what Abram had done to them. Now think about it, 318 servants, kills off an awesome skilled army. So naturally, Abram is thinking about this. He's a little unsettled. Oh boy. So he had just had a victory. He just won a, a, a battle, but he's unsettled. Now, uh, so God then comes to Abram. Now, that tells me something. That tells me that no matter what problems I may have, insurmountable problems I may have, when I feel like I can't do it alone, God will always come to me if I allow him to when I'm unsettled. When I don't have no way out, I feel like I can't, I can't get a hold of something, I, I can't grasp the thing. If I learn how to call on God and I'm established, God will always come to my rescue. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God tells Abraham, or Abram, fear not, I am your shield and exceedingly great reward. Now, that's because of your obedience. 
That's because you obey me. I'm here for your obedience. One tr translation says he came and he talked to him in his unsettled time for his obedience. Wow. So that tells us how important it is, it is for us to obey God. That has a lot to do with us having authority over anything, anything the enemy may throw against us. So God understood that if Abraham does not deal with his fears, his fears will shut down everything that God wants to do in and through him. Got it? That, that God sees he's unsettled. God sees fear and doubt setting in. And God says, now I got to do something about this because this is my man. This is the one that I'm, I've called to and wants to use to usher in the birth of my son to overcome the sins of all mankind. So now, thank God for Jesus. If you do not deal with your subtle fears in life, those things that you, you got a little problem with, those fears or bouts of impending overwhelm and trouble, that feeling that things are not going to work out, not dealing with that type of fear will rob you of every promise that God has afforded you with through his word hallelujah so now <laughs> before God can give Abram give to Abram he must deal with Abram's fear and doubt before he, before he does anything for him he's got to deal with that because <laughs> so now listen to this Abram has won a battle but God but tells God you really have not given me what I want. I really want that promise you made to me that you are going to give me a son and up to now, it has not come to pass. Now, he took him through a victory, killed a, a massive army, killed off most of a massive army with just 318 men. Now think about it. He should be rejoicing. He's alive, he's recovered his family, but now he's troubled. Fear and doubt is setting in. He's afraid of the fact that uh, Chedorlaomer might be building another army to come after him. Hallelujah. And so now, he turns to God when God says, I am your shield and ex exceedingly great reward. He turns to God and says, I, I, I don't know. Because you promised me a son I don't have. So, because of that, because of the unanswered prayer, because of the fact that he had, it had not manifested in any way, shape, or form, Abram is having doubts about God. He's having doubts about this army that's, that's, that's pursuing him. And he's, has, he's got trouble listening to what God is telling him. Now, he's listening, but he's got trouble absorbing it now because what I really want from you, I have not gotten. <laughs> Oh, God is good. Now, God now has to address this. He's got to address it. Just like in your life. You got petitions on the table. You've believe, been believing God for stuff. It has not happened. God has given you kingdom authority. Something's wrong. Something's become unplugged. Something, something's going on. You have not turned the next page. Something is happening but you're still not getting what God has promised you. And one of the reasons why we may not be getting, is because, getting it is because <laughs> just like Abram, God checked Abram's motives and checked the words he said and found out that he was on the crust of fear and doubt. Now think about it. And God has to get him back to get him to think right again. And so now, uh, God says to him, fear not, I am your shield and exceedingly great reward. He's told him that. But now, he also is telling, telling him when he says that, he says, look, man, look, nothing's changed. I'm the same God now that I was that carried you through that victory. I'm the same God now that instructed you to leave the land where you were staying and I was going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm that same God. 
Same guy, nothing's changed. I am your shield and your protector. So don't worry about Chedemiah, Lomire. I'm your shield and I'm your protector. So you must know, <laughs> you must know, and I'm talking to you now, you must know that God is your protector. You got to know that. You got to get a revelation of it. When you walk in kingdom authority, you must know that God is your protector. He got your front, he got your back, he's got the, <laughs> what you're walking on, he's got the area over your head. God is your protector. Hallelujah. You got to know that. You must know that God is your protector or you will never see your future because you would be too busy looking at your past. Too busy looking at your past. You can't operate in kingdom authority always referencing your past for the bad things. Oh, but look back at it and say, oh, look where the Lord has bought me from. I think in the culture church, we just used to sing a song, something like, uh, look what the Lord has done. He bought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. So now, <laughs> he says, I am your shield, exceedingly great, and exceedingly great reward. Now, Abram has a choice. He can either trust God or run. One of the two. Hmm. So then, In verse 1, chapter 15, it says, after these things. So what was those things? The things I just told you about. Those were the things that Abram had to go through. So what does after these things mean? It means this is a point in life where the odds of success are against you. And we've all been there. This is the point in life where the odds of success are against you. When the doctor tells you you won't live, when, when the banker tells you you can't get that loan that you need. And all, we've all been there. Hallelujah. After these things. After these things is defined as a point in time in life when if you do not make the right choice, you will derail your destiny. Hallelujah. A time in life that if you don't make the right choice, it will derail your destiny. After these things is a point in life where if you compromise, you could also, uh, you could also in the process defame your character. Hallelujah. I will only go as far as my integrity will take me. If it doesn't take me there, I can't go there. Got it? I will only go as far as my integrity will take me. Anything beyond that, you've lost me. Hallelujah. Then, <laughs> there were three things or three dynamics that went into after these things. No, number one was the destiny moment. Number two was the decision moment. Number three is the defining moment. And number four is the devastating moment. Stay with me another five minutes, we'll be through. The devastating moment. The destiny moment when it comes to after these things is that point in time in my life where the decision I make controls my destiny like Moses did. Moses made a decision after the burning bush experience that he was going to do what God called him to do. Gideon made a decision after these things. <laughs> he made a decision and got up out of the threshing floor and led the people of God to victory after these things. So everybody has an after these things moment or situation that came up in their lives. Then another thing that happens in the after these things moments is a decision making moment. This is a decision making moment in our lives that is, call, that is called after these things or these moments, listen to this, because if I do not make the right decision at that time, I could spend a lifetime trying to recover. That's a decision moment. If I don't make the right decision at that time, I'll spend a, lot, a, a lifetime trying to recover from that decision, that decision 
that I made. made. Then another thing that could be in the uh, after these things moments is the defining moment. That's, a, this, that's, that's <laughs> defining moments are situations when your character is on the line, where you could be tempted to compromise and lose your commitment to righteousness. And when you lose your commitment to righteousness, you lose your promotion and you forfeit your righteousness. Real quickly, I remember we were, uh, I went to some investors in, uh, in Chicago and they were helping me with the financing for a, a building project that we had. And we were sitting down there, all these papers out on the table, it was about six of us in the room. It was me and then all their people. And then the, 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 uh, uh, the CEO said, you know what? We can do this thing. This is a great one. I'm going to have you all pumped up. We can do this thing. This is a great loan. We got it going on. We'll give you extra in this loan because of this and because of that. Then he said, but what I want you to do, I want you, I want you to fudge this number a little bit. When he said that, it was over. I told him I can't, I'm not fudge, fudging any numbers. See, because once, if I fudge the number, my name is on the line, our, 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 our church is on the line, but they're not. They ain't got their money and run off. And so I said, I can't do it. I never went back because he tried to get me <laughs> to, 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 to uh, sabotage my character. Amen. Hallelujah. And forfeit my integrity can't let that happen. Amen. Then last but not least is the devastating moment. This is a moment where we face some tough times in our lives. Ma'am, my family, of course, you know, we just got over, get, we're getting over a tough time in our lives with the death of our son, or our middle son. But you know what? Jesus is Lord. These are all defining moments. So uh, what you going to do after these things? Are we going to, are we going to blame God? Or are we going to strengthen ourselves, gird up our loins, become more established in the word, and beat the devil down? What are we, what are we going to do after these things? And that's the question that we have to answer today. The, the question you have to answer today is after these things. After these things is important for us because after these things represents a time of pressure. It could represent a time of pressure, a time of promise, a time of prophecy, a time of promotion, a time of his presence, in his presence, or, or it could be a time where you experience the power of God. God is good. So now, after these things, after these things, God spoke to Moses as, spoke of Moses and spoke to Moses after, the, after excuse me, as a friend. Now think about it. Up till then, Moses stuttered. Moses was a murderer. He murdered a person. He just missed God. <laughs> He ran off into the wilderness. This is Moses. Yet, God now, hallelujah, after these things, he calls him a friend. David, we know David's story. David is a powerful uh, a man of God. But it was after these things, those things that he went through earlier in life, it was after those things. I don't have time to go through all those things, but it was after those things. God said about David, he's a man after my own heart. After these things, after he numbered Israel when God told him not to, God says, after these things, he called him a man after my own heart. Amen. Uh, after these things, God called Jacob Israel. Jacob was a self-centered man who thought of his business and him getting, a, getting, getting what he wanted in life. And he forgot about God for a moment. And when God came to visit him, he was asleep. He thought he was in a big, big dream. But he learned something from there. Next, then, next time God, in the form of an angel, showed up, or the angel showed up, he wrestled with that angel all night. He said, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. After these things, after these things, after these things, after these things, God called Samuel three times. Because God's lamp had not gone out on his people. Called Samuel three times. After these things. After these things. After these things. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus was called Abram's redeemer. He was called Abel's vindicator. He was called Noah's ark. He was called Abraham's sacrifice. Moses' burning bush in the fire. Hallelujah. After these things. After these things. 
He was called uh, Luke's great physician, uh, Matthew's king, Mark's suffering servant. Hallelujah. Acts was the coming of the Holy Spirit after these things, after these things. So after you've gone through all you've gone through, after those things, what you going to do? What you going to do? After all that, after they took the house or somebody in your family died or you had to deal with bankruptcy or, or, or you got divorced or your children went haywire or, or you lost your job or you got COVID-19 or you're afraid of COVID-19 or uh, uh, you mixed, got mixed up in some things. What, after those things, what are you going to do? I don't know about you, but after those things, Jesus is still Lord in my life. After those things, with everything that went on, Jesus is still Lord. What about you? What about you? After those things, after everything you've gone through, is Jesus still Lord of your life? Is he still Lord of your life? Hmm? After those things? Hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. After those things. Three Hebrew boys in the fire furnace. They're in the furnace. And they walked out of there after those things. They never gave up their position in the family of God. Whew. They didn't quit. So what are you going to do after the things? Because we're going to all have after these things. We all got them going on. Either now or we come out of it or we're headed towards something. But it's going to always be after these things. And God has said, what you going to do? I'm your shield and exceedingly great reward. What you going to do? Hallelujah. 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 So now, we walk by faith, not by sight. Again, I want to thank you for your giving. Thank you for what you've done for us and what you give to this ministry. We really appreciate and we believe God for the corresponding return on your investment in the kingdom of God. Now comes the most important part of this service. That important part is leading the laws to Christ. If you're here to hear in, in hearing shot of this, of, of this teaching, what are you going to do after those things? You know, when the devil told you you were so bad you couldn't get back to Christ, or you were so bad but, and Christ doesn't love you, don't want to have nothing to do with you, your mama rejected you, daddy rejected you, and God has to, those are all lies. If you're watching this broadcast, this is your day. This is the first day of the rest of your life. I'm going to lead you in prayer right now. And once we get through with this prayer, you'll be in the body of Christ. Don't worry about what other people are saying. Don't worry about who's standing around you, who's sitting around you. Maybe they're laughing, talking, doing something else. This is your time to give your life to the Lord. Get on the winning team so that after those things, you'll see a move of God in your life like never, never before. After those things, you'll be able to call those things that are not as though they are and see God manifest his best in your life on a daily basis after those things. So now, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I'd like you to bow your heads, raise your hands to the Lord, repeat this after me, say, Father, in the precious name of Jesus, I thank you for giving me your son who died and rose again the third day for me. I receive Jesus now as my personal Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, Lord, just as I am. And I thank you for having done that in Jesus' name. I thank you for the baptism with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. So, Lord, I give you praise now. I raise my hands to you, and I thank you that I, that I can proclaim that I'm saved and filled with the precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, say amen. Give God a praise for that. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, what I need you to do, if you said that prayer with me, hallelujah, you can say it later in, in your own words, but if you said that prayer, I want you to text NCCC to 71441, hit all to call invitations, and then go to the first item under that, which says to receive salvation. Now, you've already done it, so just give us your information, and we have a gift that we'd like to send you. Now, if you're calling, you want to become a member, an e-member of New Covenant Christian Center, and you'd like to... Uh, join this ministry online or whatever, then, 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 then uh, text 
NCCC to 71441. Go to altar call invitations. Go to the second item. Become a member at New Covenant Christian Center and give us your name. Give us your, your information. And what we want to do is send something to you. We got a gift we want to give you. Hallelujah. All those, that information is kept confidential. We don't share with anybody without your express written or verbal consent. Number three then, if you need prayer for healing, and we, and we pray for folk around here and they get healed, you can text NCCC to 71441, and then whatever your prayer request is, leave your prayer request there, we'll pray for you, amen. Hallelujah. In fact, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray for all those who are under attack physically and mentally in the name of Jesus. I cover them in the blood of Jesus, and I proclaim by the word of God, the healed and whole in the mighty name of Jesus. I command the enemy to, to loose from his maneuvers in their bodies and their minds, and we call them free, whole, healed, and delivered. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. We walk by faith, not by sight, no matter what.